So uh, welcome back, everybody. It's uh, 11.50. We will start with the next talk uh, by Stephanie Blankenborg. Uh, my name is Mario. I've been empowered by Daniel to moderate this session. And um, yeah, Mrs. Blankenborg is um, head of uh, Debt Development and Finance at UNCTAD. Uh, she's a specialist on uh, growth theory and institutional aspects of growth and development. And also, if I'm correctly informed, a professor at SOAS. And uh, so, yeah, the we have uh, about 45 minutes and plus 15 minutes of questions, and the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Mario. And uh, first of all, a warm welcome to all of you, again, on behalf of UNCTAD on this first day of the first UNCTAD summer school on the important topic of money, finance, and debt. Very, uh, topical issue at present, certainly insofar as the international <coughs> slash global economy is concerned. Um, I hope you've all arrived without problems, settled in, and that uh, we will have uh, an engaging and inspiring week ahead as a uh, template that we certainly intend to repeat uh, in future years. Yeah, special welcome also to the Einet Young Scholars, who are an integral part, of course, of this uh, endeavor. Now, uh, as uh, Mario said, I uh, am also based at UNCTAD, as Richard is heading a branch in the division uh, for which Richard is a director. The division is the Division on uh, Globalization and Development Strategies. The branch I had is the branch that is concerned uh, with many of the issues uh, that are the topic of this uh, particular summer school. Now, my brief for uh, today has been in around 45 minutes, um, look at uh, the uh, problems, contemporary problems with uh, in the international monetary system, emphasis on monetary, not uh, financial system, and the implications of those difficulties for developing countries. Now, that's a fairly steep brief, since, of course, um, looking at the international monetary system is uh, a very large topic, uh, both not necessarily straightforward topic in terms of economic theorizing about it, uh, and also a topic that is quite complex from the point of view of the uh, interface between economic analysis, macroeconomic analysis uh, of the global economy and political issues concerning the organization and coordination of uh, economic policies at the international level. So uh, what I'll do is, is up there uh, right now, I will just uh, briefly uh, summarize what the key functions are of an international monetary system. Uh, and also what these are from the point of view of uh, developing countries in the global economy. Then move on to uh, what I call the really briefest of histories of modern international monetary systems. I'm not entirely sure to what extent many of you may already been, uh, be familiar with many aspects of those, uh, so I will only summarize uh, core features <coughs> of um, ways of uh, international monetary governance that have uh, prevailed over the years and their main uh, um, role in the global economy before uh, moving on to what the current um, international, um, uh, I should say international monetary non-system, which is what it is, uh, the, the, the challenges that system poses, again, particularly from a developmental perspective, since, as you know, uh, Shuli and Richard has made clear as well, our uh, interest at UNCTAD is, of course, uh, in particular, in, and in particular in this division, to look at uh, the evolution of and particular dynamics of the global economy from the perspective of developmental interests and, and, and um, issues that concern uh, the, uh, the promotion of uh, late economic development. And finally discuss uh, what ways forward there may be. It is currently um, 
and that came through, I suppose, also in Richard's talk, um, a pretty depressing situation, but we don't want to bog everybody down with uh, going over and again uh, over all the, uh, the downsides of what is currently going on. Um, but I'll be looking at what would be, a, uh, I call it an ideal solution, but what would be a, a, a rational solution to the conundrums posed by the current non-system of um, international monetary relations, uh, but also at what might be second best politically, uh, m potentially more viable alternatives to that idea solution that is fairly well known, but that uh, clearly does not stand any uh, particular political chances of seeing the day of light anytime soon. Okay, so um, you've been treated this morning to the uh, unctured view of the world in some detail, to which, of course, uh, being a loyal member of UNCTAD stuff, I uh, subscribe to. Um, and I will now focus in from that wider perspective and refer back to some of the uh, issues that Richard mentioned this morning um, in regard to a discussion of the international monetary system. In the course of the summer school, of course, you will be looking at a number of uh, much more specific uh, aspects of what, uh, um, what would characterize, describe international monetary as well as financial relations uh, in the world economy and in, in particular regions of the world economy. <coughs> Um, so this is, in a way, a bit of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a topic to start you off from a pretty global perspective. Now, uh, what is an international monetary system meant to do? Um, two things in particular that are pointed out here. First of all, uh, the, core, the core role of an international monetary system is to provide international liquidity. And to provide international liquidity uh, in a way that allows for um, balanced productivity and employment growth or expansion across all economies uh, uh, in, the <coughs> in, the world, uh, in the world economy. Often what you will find is that uh, there's a description of key functions of the international monetary system that looks, that focuses in on the provision of uh, financial, macroeconomic and financial stability. So it is, uh, it is some uh, set of uh, uh, policies and regulations uh, that should ensure that exchange rates will be relatively stable, uh, that current account positions across countries are sustainable, uh, meaning uh, there will always be reasons why countries have to be in uh, uh, take deficit and, and surplus positions, but these positions uh, should be sustainable in the longer run. And where, if sustainability issues arise and adjustment is required, be it from a deficit or a surplus position on the current accounts and or on the capital accounts, uh, the role of the, of the international monetary system should be to ensure that any kind of shocks to the system from the perspective of individual countries or regions uh, should be orderly. That's true. There's not anything particularly wrong with that description, except that a properly functioning international monetary system, importantly, has to be focused on expansion, on balanced expansion. I, that's, it, is a di it is meant to uh, provide space for economic dynamics over time, not just to ensure stability at any one moment in time. That's important to, uh, to keep in mind. Second, of course, uh, an international monetary system is not just some uh, theoretical set of uh, rela economic relations or relations between economic variables, but it is a governing system. It is a system of economic governance in the, in the sphere of monetary relations that has to balance uh, policy coordination between states um, on the one hand with the need for national policy spaces. Again, Richard has already mentioned the tension between um, uh, certain processes that are dominating the global economy, in particular uh, currently from the, uh, from the end of, of uh, the role of financial, international financial <coughs> relations, uh, and the implications this can have 
uh, for domestic policy space. By policy space, I'm referring to macroeconomic policy space. I'm referring to uh, the effective use of macroeconomic policy tools, such as exchange rate, interest rates, a uh, range of other policy tools, credit uh, policies, uh, development of, of uh, financial and banking sectors, for example. Uh, the the uh, space for maneuver that is required by governments uh, to adapt the combination of those policy tools effectively for uh, specific economic objectives. And from the point of view of developing countries, of course, uh, a particular requirement to balance uh, uh, international policy or, co or coordination with policy space to allow uh, for the implementation of policies for structural transformation, which is a pretty uh, um, high, uh, pretty tall order in the first place. Now, from the from the global perspective, sorry, they dry the air. Um, that's not all that is to be said. These are sort of generic functions of what uh, a monetary international monetary system that uh, does its job should be doing. Now, we live in a world in which we have advanced economies, uh, developed economies, and we have uh, a, a large number of the majority of economies that are in the process of structural transformation. So what we need is not just an, uh, an international monetary system that does what I've just said, but one that is development friendly, i.e. that is organized in a way that facilitates catching up economic development. From the point of view of the IMS, that particularly means putting in place policy, international policy coordination that will support the financing of these structural transformation processes that will be with us successfully or otherwise for many uh, decades to come. What does that mean um, for developing countries to uh, um, to flourish in an international in an environment of uh, supportive international monetary relations? They have to have long-term access to foreign dem dem demand, i.e., to uh, uh, basically export markets in higher productivity uh, economies. Since the idea is not uh, or that sometimes put forward that uh, we have a financing shortage, we have a, a we are looking at low productivity economies that therefore um, generate um, limited amounts of uh, of saving and investments. But uh, what we what we need to focus on in, in in terms of developmental process is the setting off and then the supporting the dynamic uh, support for what uh, um, uh, heterodox economists, <coughs> I should say, and I'm said following them refers to as the profit investment nexus, i.e. what we need to get off the ground in developing countries is uh, in, uh, economic institutions as well as wider uh, administrative organizational uh, 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 patterns that allow uh, um, the, the, the emergence or where this already has happened, the further uh, development of an entrepreneurial class, i.e. of um, a situation in which uh, investment, <coughs> or in which past profit can be used for further productive investment, generating future profit, therefore future investment. Um, that requires certainly initially, but for quite a long time, reliable access to export markets, i.e. it requires uh, uh, the ability to use uh, effective demand in uh, uh, abroad <coughs> and not only in, in a domestic context. And it of course requires that access also in order to earn the international currency that is required to pay back external debt. That is an important financing mechanism at this stage and for, for, for a long time to come. Secondly, uh, a functioning and development friendly international monetary system would ensure that surpluses in high productivity economies, high emphasis on high productivity, not on just any economy in the world, that surpluses are systematically recycled to lower productivity economies, <coughs> uh, many of which will uh, are very likely to be deficit economies, but even if they're not uh, uh, deficit economies, through uh, what has already been uh, said by, by, by uh, uh, adopting expansionary monetary uh, fiscal policies <coughs> and uh, including also industrial policies at home uh, to um, 
stimulate domestic uh, demand for imports from lower productivity economies by uh, channeling productive foreign direct investment into uh, either deficit economies and or uh, developing economies and by lending uh, what I, I put it in quotation marks since that in itself is, a, is a rather a big debate by lending uh, or either reasonable commercial uh, rates and conditions or on concessional uh, terms to these economies. These are mechanisms through lending, through investment, uh, through imports uh, that uh, um, that circumscribe this uh, recycling mechanism if it is functional. Importantly, what that means is, of course, that a developmental friendly IMS is one that has to sustain substantial long term macroeconomic imbalances over time. We are not looking at a system uh, that is trying to uh, minimize those imbalances. The point is that imbalances are necessary, but these imbalances have to be of a specific type a developmental friendly type, as, as just um, described, to allow uh, uh, domestic uh, structural transformation or development strategies to, uh, to, to unfold over what very likely normally are uh, many years uh, and usually at least several decades. <coughs> and as I said as well, of course, also to allow the use of external debt uh, for financing purposes, uh, i.e., sorry, under conditions under which that uh, uh, debt can be paid back through export earnings. Now, the point about this is that just as, say, uh, a domestic profit investment mechanism, as, say, people like uh, Polanyi, for example, pointed out very clearly, and way before him, someone like, <coughs> like Marx, of course, does not just happen. This happens through uh, policy intervention. Now, that policy intervention can be a policy intervention that has unintended consequences if you have all the time of the world and you're the first country to embark on, on original capital accumulation processes, etc. that may be the case. Um, but when you are catching up, you are looking at uh, a planned uh, um, policy intervention in order to um, allow these kinds of features to emerge. They don't just happen by any chance. And in uh, what Angtad regularly refers to as hyperglobalization, i.e. at financialized globalization from around the mid and 90s um, onwards to um, today, the important thing to keep in mind, there is no mechanism, no spontaneous mechanism that would ensure such an uh, international monetary system to emerge, uh, i.e. It, it does require uh, active, proactive, clear-headed policy decision and policy or 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 uh, coordination at the international level for anything like this remotely to emerge. Now, I'm not telling you any secret if I'm saying currently, of course, we are way off the, the, the wall, really. Um, now, before returning to, 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 to what the current state of affairs and what are particular features beyond, say, a broad understanding of, of uh, neoliberalism, um, I thought it might be useful to just briefly run through the history of, of international monetary systems as these have existed in, in, in relatively modern economic times, that is, from the emergence of um, recorded and, and um, explicit international, in quotation marks, uh, what was meant, what was c considered to be international from uh, really the mid-19th uh, century, but here is in, uh, um, officially often dated with the uh, uh, gold standard period starting in the 1880s, i.e. the late uh, 19th century. Um, I'm, I wasn't quite sure to what extent you are already familiar with these various characteristics. I'm keeping this uh, very brief. There would be uh, at least a lecture could easily be spent on each of these periods um, because they have a lot of interesting aspects to them that are not necessarily covered in textbook <coughs> international economics. But I'll just try and, uh, and walk you through it uh, relatively uh, quickly. That means the gold standard period, the interwar period, Bretton Woods period, and then uh, what we are faced at, uh, with at present. Now, the gold standard period uh, that as I said, started at the end of the 19th century, goes to uh, the onset of the First World War. Um, 
is a period that nowadays often, or not often, but sometimes is looked back to with some uh, nostalgia by a certain type of economist, generally m uh, placed on the on the on the on the right wing spectrum of economic policy um, analysis. <coughs> Um, because it was a period, or it's a period that was considered uh, as a fairly stable economic period. Whether that is true or not is a different matter, and that's what I meant when I said one can go into uh, just talking about that period for quite a long time. Uh, it below the bottom line is no, that wasn't true. Um, but it is considered a period in which there was a mechanism at place that allowed for automatic adjustment of. Uh, in particular trade imbalances between economies through what is referred to as the price specie flow mechanism, specie being gold, in this, sometimes it was silver in this, uh, in this context. Now, um, the by, at, by 1980, mm -hmm. most advanced, or nowadays advanced economies had uh, developed something called a central bank, uh, not for that long a time in many cases, but there were central banks, and the job of the central bank in under this kind of international uh, re kind of international regulation, really was um, to ensure the parity of the domestic currency, whether that be the British pound or it was the U.S. dollar or the French franc, uh, whatever it was, with uh, gold, a certain amount of gold, uh, at a fixed price, <coughs> and uh, that policy objective. Uh, was taking place under the condition of free convertibility of money into gold most of the time. Now, the idea is, is a very much a standard, very mechanical, what is often referred to as a uh, um, neoclassical uh, kind of approach. The idea was that there would be automatic adjustment through price mechanisms, i.e. you will have, uh, if you have a, a, a current account surplus, you will have gold coming into your economy, that drives your domestic prices up, it lowers your, your, your international competitiveness and vice versa for deficit countries uh, that will be losing gold uh, <coughs> uh, will have therefore, a, a, a because of neoclassical understanding of the relationship between money supply or liquidity and, uh, and uh, price levels, uh, it will lower domestic price levels and um, increase international competitiveness to put it uh, very, very briefly. So there was the idea there was this automatic market-based uh, uh, mechanism that would ensure that external balances are kept. In fact, it is a period that was pretty good at ensuring that external balances uh, were kept, uh, but because it was a policy objective. Now, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, um, was gazing about this period, calling it a uh, um, barbaric relic, I think was, is the expression. Um, why? Because it is, of course, a, uh, it is a mechanism that allows external balancing, but it does so at the expense of deficit countries. So if I am a deficit country that's importing more than I'm exporting, for whatever the reasons may be, that may be good or bad reasons, um, if I uh, come under pressure because too much gold is leaving my reserve bank and I cannot keep the fixed parity with the price of gold that has been, uh, that has been set, what will I do um, to adjust? I have to adjust by lowering economic activity in my economy, right, to bring down, uh, to bring down imports. And that kind of adjustment mechanism <coughs> is what, uh, what uh, um, uh, Keynes referred to as barbaric because it basically means that countries who need more imports than exports, because maybe, for example, because they are developing, um, have to prioritize balanced uh, external balances over ec uh, domestic economic uh, uh, job creation and full employment, full use of their resources, and over uh, um, longer-term policies that may have an intertemporal trade-off between uh, external deficits and uh, uh, internal um, uh, full employment uh, um, policies, full employment not just in terms of people having jobs but in terms of making full use of your productive uh, resources and using monetary mechanisms, including credit mechanisms, for this purpose. That means this is a system in which deficit countries have to go for austerity, w which we would say uh, 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 nowadays if they uh, don't want to crash out of the gold standard, which has its own um, 
uh, problematic consequences. Keynes also calls it a, 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 a relic of barbarism uh, because it, of course, ties, ties the, 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 the pace of economic, international economic expansion to the supply of gold. Gold is gold. It's stuck in the, in, the <coughs> in the earth. You have to dig it out. It is there. It is literally like what often people still, uh, for some reason, which is beyond me, associated with money, namely that it is something that sits in some uh, big um, box as a treasure and is finite. In the case of this system, it is finite. Um, because it is it is a specie. Um, that means that, of course, global expansion, therefore also uh, development as in structural transformation, is tight, is limited, is tight, is boxed in, if you like, by this. And of course, it also depends, the entire global economy depends on uh, what at that point, since the UK or, or Great Britain at the time was the lead economy, thinks um, their responsibility is towards the global economy as opposed to what they think their responsibility is to their own political priorities and objectives at home in playing lender of last resort, i.e. in, say, bailing uh, through uh, uh, transfers of gold, bailing out uh, deficit nations for the sake of keeping the global economy on a uh, uh, more or less even path. Um, that is the world uh, that prevailed until uh, not unrelated to the system, but it wasn't probably the main uh, uh, driver of it. We uh, entered the First World War, the European marginally concerned also. <laughs> <laughs> US um, uh, and, and, and the wider uh, then international world, uh, world war um, that led to uh, unprecedented and not uh, repeated so far uh, destruction in terms of human lives within the period of space of four years and uh, um, uh, physical and institutional infrastructure. Um, once the, uh, the, 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 the sense of um, destruction had exhausted itself, uh, we have the interwar period. Um, that should sound familiar. And one of the reasons I'm dwelling slightly more on the gold standard than on the interwar period is because there should be ringing bells in terms of familiarity. The interwar period is the, is the example of worst financial uh, disintegration prior to 2007 in what we can in modern terms consider an international economy of some forms. There were attempts to go back to the gold standard uh, to keep in the gold standard uh, driving austerity to extremes, in particular in Britain, should definitely, I don't know who here is from Britain, but I lived in Britain for quite a long time. It definitely rings many alarm bells ongoing, uh, but also, um, of course, in other uh, continental European economies. Uh, it, um, I it is a period in which whatever remnants of a, of a, of a taken up again international monetary order there was, definitely failed um, by the early 1930s when uh, uh, the UK, having ruined its domestic economy, having entirely failed to recover from, uh, from the First World War and, and, and uh, uh, driven austerity to about as far as it is driving it now and has for, for, for the past 10 years crashed out of the um, uh, gold standard in 1931. Um, that also meant that was the end of, 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 of there being any kind of implicitly, explicitly, de facto agreed uh, national leadership of the global uh, economy. Again, that should ring bells, mm -hmm. right? This is a situation which we are looking at now as far as the US is concerned. We are at the end of uh, um, certainly political, authoritative, uh, legitimate leadership of the US in the global economy, unfortunately not um, in terms of its privilege as issue of the international currency so far. And that was to some extent true as far as Britain is, was concerned as well. Um, what also should ring enormous bells is that, of course, that was at the same time a period, um, again, for many historical reasons, but it was a period in which the privatization of the provision of credit uh, moved to new heights and un unknown, unprecedented by the extent, i.e., we are looking at a period where in the, uh, uh, in the fragmentation of uh, s nation state based leadership of the international economy, always talking about monetary, um, uh, international monetary relationships, uh, and fairly short-sighted um, um, 
policies in regard to balancing international with, uh, with national or domestic um, priorities, um, financial capital is, is uh, going rogue, essentially, and is uh, proliferating. In this. So anybody who thinks, for example, that credit derivatives were invented at the end of the 1990s is wrong. That is a period in which credit um, derivatives see the day of light, um, ha having already existed even in the 19th, even you can follow it back to, the, to even the 18th century, but not to the extent that they become a systemic factor necessarily. But all the features that we associated with the global financial crisis were present uh, in terms of speculative uh, financial uh, bubbles in that um, period from around the mid-1920s to the onset then, of course, of the, of the Great Depression. Again, that should be ringing bells in terms of uh, what happened after the global financial crisis in terms of the so-called Great uh, Recession. There are many differences in, in the detail between that Great Depression, um, given the state of economic affairs in the early 1930s relative to, um, to, to 2008 and after. But it's this very sort of um, rough uh, uh, um, approximation from the point of view of the international monetary system. There certainly are core, um, uh, core comparisons. And many have argued uh, that uh, what the comparison is with the current period, the 10 years after the global financial crisis, is not so much um, the 1930s. People have talked about this in terms of political fragmentation, in terms of at the international level as well as in, in uh, at the domestic level in many uh, advanced economies, the rise of uh, uh, nationalist populism and so on and so on have drawn the comparison with the 1930s. Uh, from the point of view of how uh, the international economy f worked and the role of monetary relations, the appropriate comparison is with the inter interwar period mm -hmm. rather than uh, this. Now, again, major destruction happens. Uh, marginally less uh, people die than in the First World War. Uh, um, physical destruction is uh, similar and is more widespread. This time, uh, the U.S., um, is more uh, directly engaged uh, with warfare as well. So it is a, it is a properly uh, international uh, Second World War. And during that World War, from about actually 41, 42 onwards, uh, what was called uh, the Allied Nations and the, or the United Nations actually, in this place should be said, was called the United Nations at the time by Roosevelt, by um, Churchill and uh, uh, by Stalin too, actually. Um, people sit around a table and start thinking what is going to happen once this is over? What, what do we have to do in order to preserve peace? So the, 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 the objective was peace. The objective was not necessarily uh, development. The objective was not necessarily productivity growth. The objective was peace. Uh, without going into any <coughs> detail of this much, uh, many, many volumes have been written about this. We have uh, what, in retrospect, I would argue is a very exceptional period of roughly three decades, uh, where we have an international, a proper, inter we have proper international, in ec uh, international economic governance spelled out. Not ideal, not functioning, and ultimately uh, doomed to fail. Um, but those, uh, what you have up there, are the core elements. You have fixed exchange rates with a peg, i.e. Um, uh, adjustable, you have capital controls um, in order, and you combine fixed exchange rate with capital controls precisely in order to balance what is required in one sense in international economic stability with sufficient domestic policy space. That was the core rationale of having <coughs> capital controls, certainly in, in, uh, uh, in Keynes's reasoning. And you have a very proactive, lasting over many years, <laughs> uh, uh, trade liberalization against those, this background. So in, in, in a world in which you have control of capital mobility for a number of reasons, you promote trade liberalization and you promote at the same time domestic policy states to pursue in an expansionary way full employment policies or for developing countries structural transformation policies. Developing countries were not on the agenda of those people. They benefited from it by <coughs> by um, unintended positive consequences of some sort. But this was not the concern. Uh, it was the concern in GATT, in the 1947 Havana conference, has to be said, <coughs> that linked 
uh, that designed or suggested a design of an international trading system with the explicit goal of ensuring that trade was the servant of full employment. Can't be repeated often enough. Now, um, very far removed, of course, from where the WTO went from 1995 onwards following GUT and its uh, the beginning of its disappearance as of present, I would have thought. Now, it also meant that there was uh, an adjustment me mechanism for uh, balance of payment <coughs> imbalances where um, there were ideas behind, I will come to back to this, there was an ideal solution that I will come back and what I'm referring to as ideal solution suggested that was not ex 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 accepted for reasons of, pol of, of political interests largely. And in the place of that, there was uh, an adjustment mechanism that of course had the IMF in, its, in place as, as lender of last resort, if you like, uh, a kind of central bank of central banks, uh, and a mix of uh, adjustment mechanisms that would force deficit countries into deflationary adjustment, I into some form of um, austerity if required, but that also was meant to be coupled with uh, policies and mechanisms that would force surplus countries into uh, carrying a burden of adjustment in the way uh, I have already described. Uh, what remained in this, uh, 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 in, in, in the actual policy framework under the Bretton Woods system as it then worked, a so-called scarce currency clause. The idea is that surplus countries who will accumulate reserves, who will invest in, in, in financial assets rather than uh, uh, stimulating domestic demand for imports from deficit countries investing and lending at reasonable terms, will be penalized by their currencies uh, being declared scarce. Um, in practice, that never, uh, as to, my, to the best of my knowledge, never really was. It was involved, uh, uh, but was never really uh, implied. This is certainly a, a, a weak um, uh, sanction. Um, then there were a number of mechanisms where uh, countries that were experiencing or were thinking they were experiencing uh, structural difficulties in terms of um, uh, uh, balance of payment Im imbalances um, um, could appeal to the IMF to sanction uh, 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 to, to, to allow them to use uh, a currency adjustment beyond the pact value. So to basically step out of the band that they had agreed at the beginning of this, uh, to, to allow them to in practice to use devaluation as an adjustment tool beyond uh, uh, the agreed rules. And uh, the whole thing was going to be financed through the quarter system uh, that still is quarter uh, reserve system that still to some extent is in place and that currently is under a lot of discussion uh, in terms of reform requirements, um, um, say at the, well, I mean, this has been going on for some years with the uh, current uh, issuer of international, uh, the International Reserve Currency blocking attempts at reforming that particular quarter system. Um, part of it, of course, was the World Bank. Richard mentioned this uh, as well, mm, meant to be not the central bank of that system, but the development bank. So to put, uh, to put it off that system, um, initially in, in, in the view of possible uh, reconstruction requirements, but as Keynes uh, put it in the design, to develop the resources and productive capacity of the world with special attention to the less developed countries to raise the standard of life and the conditions of labor everywhere and so to promote and maintain equilibrium in the international balance of payments of all member states. Now one should sort of send this every morning um, to people who work in the World Bank, just as a reminder, uh, as you know, I don't have to go into this, it has moved um, eons uh, from this. So um, this was the sort of um, pragmatic agreement uh, that came out of much more fundamental considerations how an international monetary system should function following the Second World War. And it certainly was a, was a, was a huge step forward in the sense that it was a situation uh, where all the leading nations, and including some developing uh, nations, were sitting around a table and were deciding, okay, we will agree to this. We ha there is a set of rules, we will agree to it. It was very much dominated by the by then very much uh, uh, hugely dominant international economy, the US in terms of, the US at that time provided about, uh, produced about half of the world's manufacturing output, very far removed from its um, objective 
um, uh, uh, economic prowess at present, but at the time it was uh, by a very long way the, 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 the dominant um, economy, not least uh, because of the Second World War, has to, said, has to be said, and not least because um, there was a president in place who, who pretty much nationalized about half of the <laughs> in that war and uh, uh, drove our productivity growth, but that's a different story. Now, what I'm trying to get at is that was the first time there was an explicit agreement in, in during the Second World War, not after the Second World War, during the Second World War, and it resulted, uh, despite it, that agreement being governed by uh, tensions between what would be internationally desirable and what were national priorities, it resulted in uh, a period of 25 years probably uh, of excellent economic performance from an international, uh, from an international um, perspective. It was a period in which we see the, the uh, um, extensive trade liberalization, we see uh, capital flows dominated by um, official uh, capital flows rather than private um, capital flows. We see uh, capital flows linked relatively closely to, uh, to um, uh, productive investment, um, this is prior to financialization rather than short-term speculative flows, and it is a growth performance. You have average growth rates, average global growth rates of about, um, at the time, between 4 and 5 percent, depending you know, what, uh, what calculation you use, as opposed to half that in the period from uh, uh, roughly about the 1980s, 1990s, uh, up to the global financial crisis, not to mention anything following that. Now, what happened then? <coughs> For a number of reasons we can't go into here, that system uh, collapsed as, as, a, as an institutional system, as a kind of agreement between nation states, how to run the international monetary system uh, collapsed. And it did so, uh, it was, a, it was an um, intended explicit retreat uh, from this kind of uh, agreement, in particular by the United States. This is a quote uh, uh, from Paul Volcker, the same Volcker who um, designed the Volcker rule after the global financial crisis uh, from the end 1970s. It is tempting to look at the market as an impartial arbiter, but balancing the requirements of an international economic system, on the one hand, against the desirability of retaining freedom on, uh, of action for national policy, a number of countries, including the US, opted for the latter, a controlled disintegration in the world economy is the legitimate ob objective of the 1980s. Now what happened, what followed, I mean this is, it couldn't be clearer uh, in terms of making it clear that the US uh, was prioritizing national policy over international responsibility. It was of course not giving up the issuance of the international yield currency and it has under any government of any political color that you like ever since systematically abused that advantage to the detriment of the rest of the global economy and in particular to the rest, uh, to the detriment of developing uh, countries and it continues to do this uh, to the day. This is one of the issues which uh, need tackling and hopefully will be discussed here. Now, uh, just to see to what extent the arrangements that were at least intended under Bretton Woods ceased to have any significance and have after that continued to be significant as the carrier of, uh, uh, of economic policy um, um, rel beliefs of certain types. Uh, this is Singer, one of the most famous development economists, probably uh, making it clear that today's fund, that is uh, uh, in the, in the, uh, around the global financial crisis, today's fund, IMF is meant here, is only 2% of annual world imports. The difference between Keynes originally proposed 50% and the actual 2% is a measure of the degree to which our vision of international economic management has shrunk. That's, you know, uh, uh, on. And finally, um, to make it clear to what, what we're up against right now, <coughs> uh, Mandel against, you know, very well known, uh, broadly speaking, orthodox uh, international uh, economist, makes it clear that with that sea change at the end of the 1970s, early 1980s, since then, we haven't had an international monetary system. Right. We are looking at it, we are discussing it, but de facto, the international monetary system in the strict sense of the word does not presently exist. Every country has its own system. Most people do not understand how unusual 
this system is. For thousands of years, countries have anchored their currencies to one of the precious metals or to another currency. But in the quarter of a century since the international monetary system broke down, he is referring to the uh, Bretton Woods system, countries have been on their own a phenomenon that has no historical precedent in the cooperative game known as the international monetary system. That's still uh, where we are. Now, I know I'm coming up against previous time, but let me uh, 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 just look at what the current um, challenges are. I, I made it clear in the beginning what a developmental friend the international mi monetary system would require and that this does not spontaneously evolve. What we have had since the early 1980s until now um, in is, a, is, a, is a, a dysfunctional, underfunded um, uh, semblance of an international monetary system that is not an inter international monetary system, but that simply is uh, an internationally accepted lead currency <coughs> issued by uh, a particular nation state that puts its national goals uh, prior or, or above international goals and that therefore has produced not controlled disintegration as was is claimed by Volker in this, but it has produced uh, chaotic disintegration, the main feature of which is the completely unbridled, completely unfettered rise of uh, the financial sectors. And of, uh, that means from the point of view of the international monetary system of the private provision, haphazard, uncontrolled, uh, um, uh, unfettered provision of Li international liquidity by uncoordinated private agents. Now, that has led to imbalances in the global economy, but imbalances that are the opposite of what a development-friendly international monetary system would need. And these graphs which uh, Daniel here had put together uh, show this in terms of, uh, first of all, the current account um, imbalances. Uh, comparing 2008 to 2017, first of all, on the one hand, we see that these imbalances have shrunk on the, on the, on the, from your perspective, what's this, the left-hand side, mine as well. Uh, but on the right-hand side, you also see the shift in regional uh, distribution <coughs> of both uh, uh, current account surpluses and current account deficits. And it shows you uh, quite clearly that while in 2007 we have um, current account um, uh, um, uh, on the on the on the left hand hand we have current account <coughs> uh, surpluses uh, carried by uh, 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 a range of countries. Yellow. I have to even I have to get close to be able to to um, to read this still. Uh, um, we have you know developing countries on the surplus side. Uh, we have then uh, a, a set of advanced um, uh, uh, countries there on, on the deficit side, the deficit is carried by the US and by uh, the Europeans, but not primarily uh, developing countries. That has changed 10 years later quite considerably. The point here is that from a developing country perspective, what is uh, of obviously detrimental from the point of view of a non-coordination of the international monetary system is that it is now developing countries, in particular national resource intensive developing countries, that are carrying uh, uh, the deficit uh, uh, that are contributing substantially to the deficit side and therefore also to the uh, to the to to um, important drivers of uh, international aggregate demand this slides uh, largely largely uh, repeats this from the uh, position of the international investment uh, position of countries again uh, next slide again um, uh, what we can <coughs> What we can see uh, is not only the extension on the on the on the left hand side of, of balance sheets uh, in the global uh, uh, in the global economy, but we can also see that on the uh, creditor side we have uh, what were leading creditors, i.e., in particular Germany, Netherlands, uh, uh, but advanced economies, uh, expanding their position on the on the uh, uh, net investment <coughs> in, uh, in international investment position, whereas debtors. Um, uh, China still remaining a net creditor, but to a lesser extent uh, than previous, whereas uh, 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 net debtors is obviously the U.S. given it uh, uh, and has extended this, but again uh, uh, is very much on the back of developing um, countries. So these are shifts from the in international investment position, asset liability positions for an uh, abroad, and on the other hand, the current account uh, that are the opposite of what an international monetary system that is development friendly 
should achieve. Now, again, just summarize this. Um, now, what is the problem uh, um, that we uh, that we have in if we don't have an international and functioning international monetary system? Um, we are in a situation in which uh, weaker economies, i.e., lower productivity economies, economies with uh, uh, in deficit position, um, have very vulnerable currencies, uh, and and their currencies are very vulnerable to external shocks and external uh, fluctuations. Um, meaning that also uh, there is no, and that was meant in the beginning by saying there's no automatic mechanism, meaning also that in that uh, 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 condition of financial vulnerabilities to uh, exogenous um, shocks and therefore uh, um, limited policy space to, uh, to manage or use policy tools such as exchange rate in defense of uh, domestic policy um, interests, in, in that situation, um <coughs> Uh, investment opportunities, and I mean real long-term productive investment opportunities in the economies that most need it, i.e. developing economies, uh, diminish and become, uh, become lesser. Um, what has happened over the past few years? The, the, what we have seen is the integration of a very premature, very hasty integration of developing countries into international financial markets for a number of reasons, but partly because when this is the situation, um, what can you do? Many have tried to imitate uh, advanced country financial infrastructures, integrate more closely with advanced um, countries, uh, or to some extent build regional defense me mechanisms, i.e. use regional financial integration as a kind of defense mechanisms. But all these approaches, I, we don't have time here to go into regional financial integration, should be something, I think it's probably something which is being taken up in more detail later is, of course, an important topic in this context, but is obviously not an answer to the lack of, inter of, a, of, of, a, of a functioning international monetary uh, mechanism. And those economies that have um, tried, uh, that have integrated into international financial markets and or um, uh, had close monetary relations with, uh, with advanced economies have encountered very serious problems i.e. what I'm talking about is on the one hand dollarization in many developing countries that is a disaster, it has been proven to be a disaster for uh, very different types of developing um, economies uh, and uh, the, 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 the rapid integration into international financial markets is the core reason um, of course of the current uh, uh, debt uh, vulnerabilities and unsustainable external as well as overall debt positions in a growing number of developing um, countries. Secondly, um, it also from a developing perspective leads to a situation in which uh, that kind of financial integration, and this is looking at it from the point of view of an international monetary system, uh, means that um, uh, international monetary transaction, and that for developing countries uh, primarily means uh, the management of international reserves becomes part of integration into international financial markets. So de de even developing countries, even you know, poor developing countries, central banks do not hold reserves as gold um, somewhere in the, in, in the world uh, or stack or, or, or access to, 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 to cash accounts. They hold them as financial assets in the rest of the world and that makes them vulnerable to uh, the, the, uh, uh, the fluctuations of values of those uh, financial assets in terms of their reserve management, and it also means, of course, that a, a core macroeconomic uh, policy variable under those conditions of international monetary uh, disintegration, namely the exchange rate, uh, cannot uh, um, provide respite in that if that is used, say, for devaluation in order to improve export uh, prospects, it means that uh, the real value of debt is driven up at the same time. There are a number of dynamic mechanisms that under this condition of what Volker referred to as controlled in disintegration, but what in effect is entirely not controlled if it means state uh, controlled disintegration uh, has imposed on very substantial, very structural, uh, uh, very long term costs on developing, um, on developing countries. Now, uh, I've said this already. Now, this is the situation, uh, more or less. We have had, can I? Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Just most of you will know this. We have had a suggestion, of course. Um, all those years back after the Second World War had rattled people sufficiently 
uh, to try and take seriously interstate negotiations to establish a set of international rules that would imply some uh, concession on uh, national sovereignty in economic affairs uh, in the interest of peace, more than necessarily a productivity growth, although both these things went together. And that was uh, Keynes's plan uh, for the International Clearing Union. Now, um, given time, I, I won't necessarily go in, into the detail of this. I, as I said, I'm not quite sure to, to what extent many of you may be uh, familiar with this. Um, but the point is, of course, that uh, the, at the heart of this is an international accounting currency, i.e. a currency um, that cannot be, the point about an international uh, accounting currency is it cannot be accumulated as reserves. It is an accounting unit. It can be, uh, um, it can be used to uh, relieve imbalances that put uh, economic strain on particular, on, 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 on members uh, of that uh, of that clear union by decision of those in charge of that uh, of the issuance of that international accounting union uh, as described there in particular as uh, um, uh, accounting transactions between central banks in the global economy. But the main point um, from what we have discussed so far is it cannot be accumulated. It is, it is literally a uh, accounting tool to allow uh, domestic policy space through the temporary um, clearing of, uh, of uh, external imbalances between, uh, between member states. And it is something that is a, is, is a tool that has to be decided by uh, decision making by member states of that, uh, of that clearing union system. Now, uh, there are a number of details uh, in how this exactly was, uh, uh, was designed in order to um, uh, allow, say, uh, domestic policy space, in not least also in developing countries on the one hand, on the other hand, make sure that there wasn't an abuse of claims on that uh, uh, accounting uh, currency by uh, countries engaging in macroeconomic Ill imbalances other than for purposes of uh, productive growth, um, productive contribution to the world economy, and possibly also uh, maintaining peace. Um, there, there are a number of rules, but the point, the, the, the fundamental point is, of course, that, and Keynes says this in one, in one quote very clearly, is um, that once you have this um, accounting currency or virtual currency that is exclusively um, a form of uh, uh, bookkeeping credit creation between states and between specifically between their central banks, um, that the union can never be in any difficulty as regards the honoring of checks drawn upon it. It can make what advances it wishes to any of its members with the assurance that the proceeds can only be transferred to the clearing account of another member, i.e. you have a closed uh, 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 circuit. Its sole task is to see that its members keep the rules and that the advances made to each of them are prudent and advisable for the union as a whole. And that's, of course, uh, where, the, where the limit of this proposal stands. It requires explicit agreement, political agreement, by the member states to abdicate part of their economic sovereignty and to agree on what is advisable for the union as a whole. This is where we stuck, where we remain stuck, uh, where we probably will remain stuck for a very long time. Um, this... Nevertheless, and I, I, I recommend uh, reading it up in, <coughs> in detail in the readings um, that may also be provided, this nevertheless is the, is the uh, systematically rational, most encompassing and uh, from the perspective of future growth pers perspectives and balanced uh, international monetary system that allows for catching up development, rational proposal to make. It exists, it can be done, it is, uh, banal from a, from a technical point of view to put into place, but it requires uh, not necessarily international government that is overstating it and has been overstated for, for purposes, um, but it requires that kind um, of agreement. Now, short of that, and that's the last slide, there have been a number of, of uh, no, the one before that we can forget, the last slide, um, there have been a number of proposals uh, of sort of approximating this, which 
do not require as much explicit political agreement, which uh, find ways in the middle between having to have this abdication of national sovereignty towards uh, a, a point of international agreement on, on uh, the, the managing of the international, the governance of monetary relations in the, in the global economy. Uh, obviously, and again, you will be looking at this further in, in, in the week, uh, 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 special drawing rights expanding these to, to, to weaken uh, the abusive uh, uh, um, um, position that uh, US governments whether the current or previous ones have in terms of their role as issuer of the international um, lead currencies um, and to um, um, weaken the, the, the stranglehold of that logic on the provision of international liquidity, especially under conditions in which uh, um, the failure of the management of international liquidity has caused a major crisis. Um, a replacement, a, a sort of forum where originally the idea was namely the G20 uh, to, to provide a multilateral approach as opposed to a chaotic uh, um, financialized um, approach to these issues, uh, to in particular the issue on how to regulate adjustment mechanisms of uh, macroeconomic imbalances. Uh, that of course certainly is my view is, uh, has gone completely into the sand. Uh, the G20 is not making any, even remotely, uh, uh, is not even trying to attempt uh, to provide any kind of uh, coordinated discussion, let alone uh, um, uh, uh, proposal or implementation of that, of serious multilateral uh, coordination of, uh, uh, of an international monetary system. And even in the limited sense of providing uh, intertemporary means of, of, of uh, global adjustment. Um, there have been discussions in the absence of anything that would be a more encompassing international monetary system to at least address the, 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 the outcomes of failing to have such an international monetary system, i.e. to deal with debt crisis, sovereign debt crisis, in some systematic fashion that allows uh, adjustment, re-negotiation, uh, restructuring of that debt in the interest of continued uh, uh, growth and in developing countries, structural transformation and development. Uh, not going anywhere for now, we will certainly at ANCA keep trying. Uh, we have for my understanding is 40 uh, plus years and it's one of the things where uh, Richard rightly insists we were ahead of the, um, of the curve. Unfortunately, we very much remain ahead uh, of the curve, but we will also be um, criminally decided to uh, carry on being a nuisance with in the hope that you know, sometimes small players um, can achieve something. And then, of course, the, the, what I mentioned very briefly, there are, of course, uh, reactions that I think are now very prevalent and will become very important, and I hope some of this will be discu discussed here, that where the multilateral solutions are not on the horizon, will not be on the horizon, uh, the, the, those who have the, uh, uh, the cloud, political cloud through co coordination between governments, to rein in uh, chaotic financialization of international uh, uh, relations uh, are unwilling to do so for whatever the lobbying reasons may be. Those uh, who have the, 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 the cloud in current existing multilateral systems to put proposals on the table are not doing so, uh, are actually um, doing quite the opposite, that in that uh, situation it is obvious that for developing countries regional solutions uh, will be on the on the agenda, increasingly are on the agenda in this context of, of monetary integration. Uh, not unproblematic, haven't been particularly successful in the past for a number of reasons, uh, but are something that um, uh, that will be uh, um, that will probably be a more pro promising policy oriented research focus than uh, uh, sad hopes of. Um, there being enough shake-up at the international level for advanced uh, economies and their main uh, mostly influential co constituents, i.e. particularly large corporations seeing, uh, seeing the light, which is unlikely to happen. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie Blankenburg. What a gloomy, <laughs> gloomy conclusion there, especially difficult times for patient development finance. Um, so, 
we have actually until one. I'm not sure if we can yeah. maybe extend yeah. until yeah. ten so past one. Please. So we have um, fifteen minutes, yeah. and uh, in order not to lose time, I won't say a lot. Please, the floor is yours. Please come with questions. Yes. Are you going to collect questions? Yeah. Or? Hello again, uh, my name is Francisco Perez. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, you highlighted a few issues, uh, and I'll, I'll be talking about regional monetary systems in the afternoon, so um, I have a particular interest in this topic. You highlighted the problem of having the dollar as a reserve currency that's controlling you know, the trip and dilemma, and then also the, the asymmetry and adjustment where, where set deficit countries have to adjust, but not surplus countries. Um, since if, if we had to prioritize, do you think one is more important than the other, or are the two issues linked and inseparable. What is more important, uh, sorry, just to be clear, the deficit versus surplus? Uh, you know, if you have to push for more SDR or if you had to push for multilateral kind of uh, adjustment mechanisms, which do, should we prioritize? Uh, uh, yes, my question is regarding uh, the, the, dev dev the, the development of feature for the, uh, for the, for the uh, for, for, for what we hope uh, uh, for the for the IMS, uh, so uh, so w one of the main reason for for, for, for the winner uh, takes the, the all is is uh, if we follow Thomas Piketty argument is the the structural uh, uh, disintegration between uh, the interest rate and the the growth rate. So and uh, and I believe one of the main mechanism for uh, to reduce this this uh, this difference is by risk sharing. So how we can uh, how we can structurally or sim systematically uh, uh, make uh, the relation between capital and, and labor uh, yeah more towards risk sharing. There was some um, thank you once again for a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. I was just wondering when you were talking about a monetary system as of right now, which we have in which. You, uh, the expectation is that the lead currency country has to sort of abdicate all national sovereign, national interest, uh, and that's something that's unfeasible. I was wondering what you thought about because there has there has been always has been in the creation of all these systems this conflict between sort of maintaining uh, international monetary stability or even just the exchange rate stability of that country and domestic monetary policy. And when you talk about m policy space, that conflict between say using monetary policy to maintain full employment as one of the factors and as maintaining international, um, forget international stability, just current stability of their own country. Like, I would really like to hear your thoughts about that in this context of creating policy space. And then perhaps maybe we should, like you're saying, we shouldn't expect complete abdication on national sovereignty, but then what implications does it have for domestic monetary policy and especially this emphasis that uh, is generally there on independent monetary policy. Uh, that's what I would want to hear your thoughts on. Okay, three, and then okay. Three and maybe then three, and then we take another three. If there were also some. Okay. Um, <coughs> let me start with the with the uh, with the last. Of course, I mean. Um, yes. Uh, the 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 conflict between. Uh, the power that is uh, the, that is um, conveyed on the national government by being the issue of the lead currency is very very considerable and not often entirely understood, especially by by non economists, <coughs> etc. But um, uh, and there will I mean the one of the first questions, of course, there are solutions to this to, to an extent in terms of limiting the extent of the power that is being transferred and is currently still uh, to, to considerable extent the case in, in, in the case of the US dollar. Um, and uh, a system by which this wouldn't be the case and you abdicate, uh, I, th I don't think you're talking about abdicating of uh, entire sovereignty, you're abdicating uh, an, a certain amount of sovereignty. Now if you, if you agree to international rules of the game, uh, that is, is something which certainly after the Second World War was, was considered reasonable given mm -hmm. what the price of the Second World War was. So the question to some extent is what price are we looking at here? Yeah. So if the Second World War was enough of a price and you know, millions of, many millions of dead and, and, and uh, catastrophe, um, then why is not uh, the, 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 the blocking of economic development and the, mm -hmm. the death and poverty, prolonged poverty of many more millions of people a reason? 
um, what has to happen for that to be a reason. So that, that is a fundamental question which I think has to be asked. The you have the same d discussion about that, you know, you get shock horror, uh, GDP, debt, uh, debt to GDP growth rates which are seen, uh, you know, are seen to signal definite economic mm -hmm. catastrophe. But when it was about fighting fascism, 250% uh, of GDP was fine and it was put behind it afterwards, n not to the detriment mm -hmm. of people in, I'm talking about the UK economy, right? So the question to some extent is what, what is the political discussion we are having here? What is the uh, um, trade off between uh, agreeing to a certain set of rules mm -hmm. and national sovereignty? Now, um, we have of course examples of, of very advanced uh, economic integration. I'm talking about the EU, mm -hmm. the EMU, the, the monetary union, where uh, there is a much higher de facto uh, application of, of, of national economic sovereignty, mm -hmm. political is, 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 is a different issue, very much to the detriment of the economies that went into that for not for economic reasons, for, 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 you know, for the most part. Um, and where uh, the problem again is not necessarily the abdication of that sovereignty, but the control of those rules mm -hmm. uh, by a political project that is driven, uh, that is essentially driven by the German Central Bank is the answer to that. I, and, and you know, allies in the, in, the, in the European Central Bank. So you have a political process that makes that, uh, that creates an uh, abusive uh, uh, implementation of a type of economic policy project uh, in, in relation to which then the application of national sovereignty becomes very problematic. The answer to that is not necessarily going back just to national economic um, sovereignty because there is no such thing as, as uh, policy free international policy free national economic sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Even if you, you know, if you opt out of this, you will still have to face the rest of the world economy and you still have to face uh, um, uh, domination of your economic policy making, you know, not perhaps by, by Brussels, mm -hmm. um, but by Google and, 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 and you know, the likes, of, uh, the likes of this. So it's not like you're looking at you know, some perfect world and some imperfect world. The, 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 the answer to that is that you have to look at what the exact trade-offs are. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, um, I think that to some extent, you know, also goes to your question in terms, my answer, my straightforward answer to this would be SDRs, right? I think, uh, I mean, as a, as a, as a, as a policy pragmatist, um, I think uh, the immediate task or an immediate, a, an a immediate task is to, to, to try and promote SDRs, but try and promote them along also much stronger regional policy influences, right? That, um, um, that will be difficult enough as, as far as the system stands. Um, but I only think one can, one can honestly do this and one can see you know, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel doing this if it is understood what the absence of a truly functioning set of multilateral rules does to people, right? So we're not talking about abstract ideas about what would be great you know, in a rational world. We are talking about people, uh, uh, um, uh, about uh, policies being in place that create full employment or not. And full employment means that people have something to eat and to live. And the vast majority of people uh, doesn't have. So we're talking very real things here. So yes, pragmatically SDRs is, is you know, where people are trying to start uh, and they're talking it uh, over. That already is politically difficult enough if, um, um, you know, if Trump continues, it has been said here that Trump uh, is doing the international economy in voluntary favors. Uh, I only hope he will also do them the favor of um, ruining the U.S. currency, the U.S. dollar, to the extent <laughs> that SDR becomes that the SDRs become uh, become a more reasonable um, objective. Don't think that's likely. In terms of the last <laughs> question, risk sharing, um, interest rate versus growth rate, and the you know uh, um, external financing dynamics that uh, are linked to this. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you might mean, but um, clearly. Um, there is a tendency in terms of uh, uh, governance of international financial more than monetary uh, relations and in terms of multilateral approaches to the financing of um, development in particular to consider that uh, policy tools promoting this have to be subject to uh, the financial, uh, uh, to the logic, logic of financial risk assessment. Now to me this is religion, I mean why? Should that be the case? So, what is mentioned by 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 what is meant by risk sharing is not entirely clear to me. And between capital and labor, what you would be looking at normally is uh, long-term planning strategies, uh, in particular in developing countries, that uh, that um, 
provide risk management in so far as that risk management concerns institutional uh, macroeconomic uh, and related factors that uh, that facilitate the emergence of the profit investment matrix. Yeah. That's what I think you would be looking for. So if that is meant by risk sharing, okay. But if it is risk sharing as in we have to de design economic policy approaches to this that, uh, that subject every consideration of economic policy design to the logic of financial risk management, I, um, uh, I don't see the sense of that. Okay, so we still have uh, five minutes. There were some questions on the left side, or did they disappear? No, okay, Gregory. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, speaking about expansion of the special drawing rights, I have a question regarding the mandate of International Monetary Fund. Uh, do you think that the current mandate is up to the task? And uh, also, uh, do you think that IMF could become the lender of last resort in the current situation? Thank you. Do we have uh, another question? Yeah, over there. Uh, yeah, I also had a, a question about um, SCRs, not only about the expansion of the number of currencies in the basket, but also in terms of possible uses or liquidity of the SCR themselves. Um, and also, just a, a quick um, uh, question regarding the Target 2 experience and how the imbalances of surplus and deficit countries there, uh, I mean, the fact that it has allowed for uh, you could say an indefinite deficit on on behalf of deficit countries with automatic credit availability in the target two system. But hasn't that experience itself perhaps make surplus countries more resistant to any sort of alternative uh, uh, m international monetary system that, that would imply adjustment on, on behalf of surplus countries? Okay, so I guess it's reasonable to stop here and uh, leave the time for these. Questions. Well, that was about SDRs. Um, as far as the IMF mandate is concerned, um, it would probably require a little bit of adjustment, but fundamental mandates are actually there. It's a matter of, 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 of how you uh, interpret those in terms of the IMF as lender of last resort. It is meant to be. That was its original role, lender to be of last resort. It never has been. So the problem is not could it function as that. The problem is that it should be functioning at this, and that is failed to take this position, not just because uh, uh, the leadership of the IMF <coughs> uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, people in charge would not, uh, would not necessarily have uh, taken this seriously, but as you well know, because it has been underfunded ever since, because again, the political will for it to actually have uh, uh, to play this role was not there, and because uh, even where the IMF's own um, research analysis in at different points of its existence would have pointed to that being its central role. Uh, it is governed by board members. It is governed by member states uh, who will uh, who are resistant um, to interpret mandates, including mandates that, uh, as best I'm aware, would perfectly well allow the IMF um, to to uh, to pursue. Uh, not just uh, a stronger role for SDRs, but also internal reforms are blocked by those member states who do not want that, whether it be on the board of the IMF or whether that be in other multilateral um, contexts. So I, I don't think it's necessarily, uh, it, it leads us back to the same problem that, um, that has been raised. As far as uh, SDRs is, a, is, a, is a, as I said, you know, it's a middle of the, of the road um, pragmatic approach to to pulling back from domination by by the US dollar it, 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 and to um, free liquidity provision to some extent from that particular checkers now how that relates to target two you mean the e e EMU target two and whether that means uh, you 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 give green loud light to what irresponsible deficit strategies or, or, or what I mean the target two as as I understand it has not allowed deficits to accumulate uh, that then consequently had to be met by uh, the kind of restructuring responses that we have seen for the past 10 years. Target 2 is just a payment system. Mm -hmm. 
it, it, it simply is, a, I mean, the, the, the point there is about what kind of monetary policy has been pursued and what kind of fiscal policy and the centralization of monetary policy vis-a-vis -vis the decentralization of fiscal policy and fiscal, uh, fiscal tr transfers in order to handle imbalances within the monetary union. But there's nothing inherent in the target two system uh, other than the prescription of, of of quotas by the by the various countries according to you know the various ways that were agreed, that would systematically balance that system against surplus countries and in favor of deficit countries. Th that was exactly my point that uh, the there is no uh, uh, adjustment on on the, the side of surplus countries. Oh, that you mean that you? I thought you had meant it let it allows deficit countries to 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 carry on. No, I mean. There is no mechanism which in within the European Monetary Union, which is a monetary union, m as opposed to an international monetary system that would not be a monetary union. International currencies, accounting currencies, not done. Uh, there's nothing within that particular system that uh, would um, gear adjustment towards surplus countries, for sure. But it's also not a system that allows deficit countries to free ride, so to speak. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Stephanie Blankenburg. What a great session. Um, I hope in the next few days we can find uh, even more and work even more on the uh, new ideas uh, how to create an international monetary system that supports long run development. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's lunchtime. Okay, see you later. Uh, so, very quick announcement. Uh, I can uh, uh, take you to the UN cafeteria because I assume uh, several of you are not familiar with the Palais. So, if